Section 1 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 8, July-August, 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Venezuelan Boundary Commission and its work by Marcus Baker, Cartographer, U.S. Geological Survey. On the northeast shoulder of South America, between the mouths of the great rivers Amazon and Orinoco, lies Guiana. On the extreme east and nearest the Amazon is French Guiana, or Cayenne. Just west of this is Dutch Guiana, or Suriname. While the next division to the west is British Guiana, a colony of Great Britain, and this in turn is bordered on the west by Venezuela, one of the South American republics. Between these last two, British Guiana and Venezuela, current maps show a boundary line which, starting at or near the southern mouth of the Orinoco, for there are many mouths in its 150-mile-wide delta, runs in a southerly direction into the interior. This line, speaking in only the most general terms, is the now famous Schomburg Line. This boundary is in dispute, and has been so for more than half a century. It has been a source of prolix and interminable diplomatic correspondence and negotiation, a correspondence couched in politest phrase without concealing the earnestness, nay, bitterness underneath. Proposals and counterproposals had been made, but without success. Arbitration had been proposed, but until recently Great Britain had steadily refused to submit the entire disputed territory to arbitration. So the case dragged on for weary years. Finally, in 1886, some ten years ago, Venezuela severed diplomatic relations with Great Britain and sent her official representative away. Venezuela then sought to bring about indirectly, through the friendly aid of a third power, a settlement of the long-standing and irritating controversy. The matter was taken up by our own foreign office, the Department of State, and correspondence carried on in 1895 between Secretary Olney and Lord Salisbury. Secretary Olney, in a document resembling a lawyer's brief, much more than it does the ordinary diplomatic dispatch, stated the case as it appeared to him, and asked that it be arbitrated. To this, Lord Salisbury replied in two careful and most courteous dispatches, as diplomatists are wont to call letters, declining general arbitration. Thereupon, President Cleveland, on December 17, 1895, sent to Congress this correspondence accompanied by a brief but now famous message, a message of which, without exaggeration, it may be said that it startled the civilized world. After summarizing the correspondence and commenting upon Lord Salisbury's two replies, President Cleveland proceeded as follows. In the belief that the doctrine for which we contend the Monroe Doctrine, was clear and definite, that it was founded upon substantial considerations and involved our safety and welfare, that it was fully applicable to our present conditions and to the state of the world's progress, and that it was directly related to the pending controversy, and without any conviction as to the final merits of the dispute, but anxious to learn in a satisfactory and conclusive manner whether Great Britain sought, under a claim of boundary, to extend her possession of territory fairly included within her lines of ownership. This government proposed to the government of Great Britain a resort to arbitration as the proper means of settling the question, to the end that a vexatious boundary dispute between the two contestants might be determined and our exact standing in relation in respect to the controversy might be made clear. It will be seen from the correspondence herewith submitted that this proposition has been declined by the British government upon grounds which, in the circumstances, seems to me to be far from satisfactory. It is deeply disappointing that such an appeal, actuated by the most friendly feelings toward both nations directly concerned, addressed to the sense of justice and to the magnanimity of one of the great powers of the world, and touching its relations to one comparatively weak and small, should have produced no better results. The course to be pursued by this government, in view of the present condition, does not appear to admit of serious doubt. 
having labored faithfully for many years to induce great britain to submit this dispute to impartial arbitration and having been now finally apprised of her refusal to do so nothing remains but to accept the situation to recognize its plain requirements and deal with it accordingly great britain's present proposition has never thus far been regarded as admissible by venezuela though any adjustment of the boundary which that country may deem for her advantage and may enter into of her own free will cannot of course be objected to by the united states assuming however that the attitude of venezuela will remain unchanged the dispute has reached such a stage as to make it now incumbent upon the united states to take measures to determine with sufficient certainty for its justification what is the true divisional line between the republic of venezuela and british guiana the inquiry to that end should of course be conducted carefully and judiciously and due weight should be given to all available evidence records and facts in support of the claims of both parties in order that such an examination should be prosecuted in a thorough and satisfactory manner i suggest that the congress make an adequate appropriation for the expenses of a commission to be appointed by the executive who shall make the necessary investigation and report upon the matter with the least possible delay when such report is made and accepted it will in my opinion be the duty of the united states to resist by every means in its power as a willful aggression upon its rights and interests the appropriation by great britain of any lands or the exercise of governmental jurisdiction over any territory which after investigation we have determined of right belongs to venezuela in making these recommendations i am fully alive to the responsibilities incurred and keenly realize all the consequences that may follow i am nevertheless firm in my conviction that while it is a grievous thing to contemplate the two great english-speaking peoples of the world as being otherwise than friendly competitors in an onward march of civilization and strenuous and worthy rivals in all the arts of peace there is no calamity which a great nation can invite which equals that which follows a supine submission to wrong and injustice and the consequent loss of national self-respect and honor beneath which are shielded and defended a people's safety and greatness this short message went to congress december seventeenth eighteen ninety five where it was read and referred to the committee on foreign affairs the following day december eighteenth the chairman of that committee the hon r r hitt reported a bill h r twenty one seventy three appropriating one hundred thousand dollars for the expenses of a commission to investigate and report upon the true divisional line between british guiana and the republic of venezuela this bill was passed by the house of representatives forthwith and unanimously it was then sent to the senate it was on the following day the nineteenth of december referred to the committee on foreign affairs in the senate the next day it was reported back debated and passed without amendment the following day december twenty first it was a law having received the signatures of the speaker of the house the vice president and the president thus president cleveland's suggestion on december seventeenth that a commission be created was four days later the law of the land and made so with an unanimity almost if not quite unparalleled no vote against it was recorded in either branch of congress on january fourth eighteen ninety seven the commission was appointed and consisted of five persons to wit hon david j brewer one of the justices of the supreme court of the united states hon richard h alvey chief justice of the court of appeals of the district of columbia mr frederick r coldert a distinguished member of the new york bar who had acted as counsel for the united states in the bering sea arbitration case hon andrew d white historian and diplomatist and dr daniel c gilman a learned geographer president of the john hopkins university this commission organized by electing mr justice brewer president and mr server mallet provost of the new york bar as secretary upon this commission were laid two duties first to investigate and second to report obviously investigation was first not merely in order but in the amount of labor involved and in importance in the early sessions of the commission the whole subject was canvassed 
and the work of investigation planned, organized, and assigned. Professor George L. Burr, Cornell University, a painstaking and accurate historian and linguist, was sent to Holland to investigate the Dutch archives. Later on, he was joined there by Mr. Kudert of the Commission for assistance in the preparation of maps and in geographical investigation. Application was made to the U.S. Geological Survey. To this work I was assigned, and from January to May 1896, gave to it such time as could be spared from survey duties. In May 1896, I was, however, detailed to the service of the Commission, and continued to serve on this detail till the close of the Commission's labors and the publication of its results in June 1897. When in November 1896 it was made known that Great Britain and Venezuela had at last come together and had agreed to submit their dispute to arbitration, the Commission found itself set free from the need of pronouncing judgment. As the contending parties had themselves agreed to submit their differences to an arbitral tribunal, it was obviously for that tribunal to pronounce judgment. Moreover, as Mr. Justice Brewer had been chosen as a member of the arbitral tribunal, it was obviously improper that he should pronounce judgment in advance of his sitting with that tribunal. The Commission accordingly decided to withhold any conclusions it might have reached and to publish only its investigations. Thus, the facts gathered have become public property. The investigations undertaken were unfinished when arbitration was agreed upon, but the Commission decided to stop short and print in as complete and systematic form as time permitted the facts then gathered. The facts gathered by the Commission are set forth in three octavo volumes and an atlas comprising 76 maps. The atlas constitutes volume 4 of the report and was the first volume completed. It is composed, as above stated, of 76 maps divided into three groups or parts. Part 1 comprises 15 maps, all printed on the same base. This base map was specially compiled and engraved for the Commission and is designed to represent the latest and best information as to the natural features of the Orinoco Essequibo region. It is based chiefly on the so-called Great Map of the Colony, dated 1875, and published by E. Stanford of London in 1877. Various other maps were also made use of in its compilation. The disputed territory along the sea coast is so differently shown on maps of high authority that a compromise seemed impossible, and accordingly two different maps of the same tract are shown side by side on the base map. Map 1 shows various boundary lines proposed or claimed. Map 2, the forests of the savannas. Map 3, the principal drainage basins. Map 4, the geology of the region as far as known. Maps 5 to 14 are historical maps showing European occupation at various dates from the earliest down to 1814. These 11 historical maps, say Professor Burr, have been portrayed to illustrate my report on the evidence of Dutch official documents as to the occupation and claims of the region between the Essequibo and the Orinoco, and are an attempt to show graphically the conclusions reached by that report. It may be noted in passing that if title to the disputed tract is to be determined by occupation, these maps showing occupation are of great significance and importance. Part 2 of the atlas comprises 41 maps, facsimile reproductions of the mother maps of the region, produced during a period of about 300 years. Volume 3 of the Commission's report contains a paper by the Secretary, Mr. Severo Malat Provost, on the cartographical testimony of geographers. The 41 maps mentioned illustrate that report and exhibit the gradual evolution of our geographical knowledge of the disputed area, and also the evolution of the various boundary lines. It constitutes an interesting and instructive group of maps and makes available for students a number of scarce ones. Part 3 comprises 20 maps of an official or semi-official character, of which 12 are from manuscript originals not hitherto published. The origin of these maps, their character and meaning, are set forth by Professor Burr in a paper in Volume 3. In describing the atlas, we have, in part, anticipated the description of Volume 3, which is devoted to geography. It is an octavo volume of 517 pages and contains six papers. 
the first by the secretary of the commission on the cartographical testimony of geographers in its eighty pages the historical evolution of lines showing territorial divisions are worked out with great care and the size of the paper inadequately measures the labor needful to gather and arrange and clearly set forth and discuss the facts therein contained the second paper is by dr justin windsor librarian of harvard college and it deals with the same topics as the preceding paper but in a different manner this paper was submitted to the commission very early its date being march fourth eighteen ninety six just two months after the commission was appointed the third and fourth papers are by professor burr the fifth paper entitled notes on the geography of the orinoco esquibo region south america is by the present writer it consists of a prosaic compilation of statements made by various travelers and explorers in the region as to its geography with references in footnotes to the sources of these statements all the geographic names found applied in the region whether now in use or not were recorded in these notes which are fully indexed thus it is possible to proceed quickly by means of the index and footnotes to the original sources of geographic information touching any part of the country described in these notes the last paper in the volume is a partial list of maps of the region also prepared by the writer it was hoped to make an exhaustive list but time did not suffice for this nor for the preparation of a bibliography of the region volume two is given mainly to extracts from dutch archives there are three hundred fifty three of these extracts comprising six hundred sixty two pages they are printed in double columns the original dutch forming one column and the english translation the parallel column some miscellaneous manuscript documents filed with the commission by the government of venezuela close the volume volume one first in order but last to be published is now in press and will shortly be published it is to contain the report of the commission which however is not new to the world having been published may twenty fifth eighteen ninety seven as senate document number one o six fifty fifth congress first session it is to contain also a report by professor j f jameson of brown university on the treaty of munster of sixteen forty eight and also professor burr's report upon what he found in the dutch archives bearing upon the boundary matter exact reproductions of those dutch documents with translations constitute the major part of volume two professor burr's report however will tell a connected story of dutch occupation and doings in the disputed territory as gathered from these old manuscript chronicles of the dutch with the publication in the summer of eighteen ninety seven of these four volumes the labors of the venezuelan boundary commission end the controversy however is not ended and its settlement has been relegated to a new tribunal a tribunal of arbitration to be composed of five of the world's leading jurists the commission whose work now ends it will be remembered is wholly a united states commission the united states devised it created it and maintained it and it did this to determine with sufficient certainty for its own justification what is the true boundary line between british guiana and venezuela it is a high compliment to the character of the commission that both great britain and venezuela promptly and cordially aided it to the fullest extent by furnishing information fully and freely neither was bound so to do and neither had agreed to accept its conclusions but as time progressed it became clear that this quasi or involuntary arbitration if i may say so might well be turned into an actual arbitration an arbitration where all the facts could be sifted out judicially weighed and a just conclusion reached accordingly at the lord mayor's banquet in london last november lord salisbury announced that an agreement had been reached by which the long drawn out controversy was on its way to a peaceful amicable just and final determination an agreement to arbitrate had been reached that the action taken by the united states some eleven months before was a powerful agency towards securing this much to be desired end does not admit of doubt such is the prevailing opinion such is the opinion of the commission itself which in its report says a wise and just view of the case is that the commission has been a potent factor in bringing the two nations into a consent to submit the matter in dispute to an arbitral tribunal 
in addition to the influence exerted by the commission in initiating the peaceful settlement of the dispute the contribution which it has made to the scholars of the world should not be overlooked the investigations in history and geography set forth in the papers accompanying its report have a value wholly apart from the case to which they owe their origin a few words about the arbitral tribunal and the work before it must end this already too long article on february second eighteen ninety seven a treaty of arbitration as to the boundary was signed in washington by senor jose andred for venezuela and by sir julian Poncefote for great britain it consists of fourteen articles describing the precise legal and formal phraseology how the dispute is to be disposed of a public copy of that now public treaty lies before me as i write let me summarize it first an arbitral tribunal is to be named forthwith second it is to be composed of five jurists two named by venezuela and two by great britain venezuela names chief justice fuller and mr justice brewer of the united states supreme court and great britain names baron herschel and sir richard h collins of her majesty's privy council these four are to select on or before september fourteenth eighteen ninety seven a fifth arbiter a jurist who is to be president of the tribunal in the event of failure to do so the fifth arbiter is to be chosen by the king of sweden third the tribunal is to determine what belonged to the netherlands and what to spain at the time when great britain acquired from the dutch what is now british guiana fourth the tribunal shall take account of all pertinent facts shall be governed by the principles of international law and by three rules to wit a adverse possession or prescription for fifty years to constitute a good title b the arbitrators may recognize and give effect to laws supported on any other valid formulation than adverse possession and which conform to international law c in determining the boundary if the tribunal shall find that the territory of one party was at the date of the treaty occupied by citizens or subjects of the other it shall give to such occupation the effect which in its opinion is required by reason justice and the principles of international law and the equities of the case fifth the arbiters are to meet in paris within sixty days after the printed arguments have been submitted and decide the question submitted all questions to be decided by a majority each party to appoint an agent to assist the tribunal sixth within eight months that is on or before february fourteenth eighteen ninety eight the case is to be submitted with proofs documents etc seventh within four months thereafter that is on or before june fourteenth eighteen ninety eight the counter case is to be similarly submitted and may contain new matter with proofs eighth within three months thereafter that is on or before september fourteenth eighteen ninety eight the agent of each government must submit his argument in print oral arguments may then be had ninth the arbiters may lengthen each period above named by thirty days tenth decisions to be rendered within three months after the case has been argued to be in duplicate in writing and signed by the arbiters who assent to it eleventh an exact journal of proceedings is to be kept twelfth each government is to pay its own agent and the cost of the arbitration shared equally thirteenth the parties agree to be bound by the decisions rendered it thus appears that the controversy bids fair to reach its final stage sometime during the winter of eighteen ninety eight ninety nine end of section one Section 2 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 8, July-August, 1897. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Mineral Production in the United States by J. H. The mineral products of the United States in the calendar year 1896 had a total value according to a recent report of the u s geological survey of six hundred twenty one million nine hundred sixty nine thousand 
$9,943, the value of the metallic products being more by $4,868,931, and that of the non-metallic less by $5,586,656 than in 1895. The great increase in the production of pig iron so much commented upon last year has not been maintained, the output having fallen off by more than 800,000 long tons, representing a decrease in value of nearly $15 million. On the other hand, the production of gold has increased from $46,610,000 to $53,088,000, that of silver from $36,445,000 to $39,655,000, and that of copper from $38,682,000 $347 to $48,698,267. Gold shows an increase of over 60% in four years. The production of silver is the largest since 1893, and even the output of copper has almost doubled since 1889. The most remarkable increase, however, is that of aluminum, the production of which has increased from 18,000 pounds worth $59,000 in 1887 to 1,300,000 pounds, valued at $520,000 in 1896, the value per pound having fallen, as will be perceived, from $3.28 to $0.40 cents within the period named. To return to a comparison of the statistics of 1896 and 1895, an increase in the production of bituminous coal from 135,118,193 to 137,640,276 short tons has been accompanied by a sufficient decline in prices to reduce the total value of the output from $115,749,771 to $114,891,515. On the other hand, a considerably smaller production of Pennsylvania anthracite has represented almost as great a value in the market as the output of the previous year. The production of building stone has been the smallest in point of value, quantities are not being reported, since 1888, but the estimated production of brick clay is still represented by the same round figures, $9 million, that have done duty for the last half dozen years. There appears to have been a considerable increase, nearly 4 million gallons, or over 18%, in the sale of mineral waters. It would be interesting to know how far this remarkable increase is due to the use of non-medicinal mineral waters for table purposes, and how far it is to be attributed to the apparently largely increased use of lithia water as a remedy for certain bodily ailments that seem to be peculiarly characteristic of our time. Of the remaining principal products reported upon, petroleum reaches in 60,960,361 barrels, the highest figure its production has ever attained. Salt shows a slight increase in production, with a considerable decrease in value, and the production of borax, no less than 13,508,000 pounds, is the largest on record, with the single exception of that of 1894. End of section two. Section three of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume eight, July August eighteen ninety seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in June two thousand eighteen. The Forests and Deserts of Arizona by Bernard E. Ferno, Ph.D., LL.D., etc., Chief of the Division of Forestry, U.S. Department of Agriculture. It is a notable fact that but few of our people have any adequate conception of the vastness and the varied conditions of their country, and still less do they realize its opportunities for future growth. The horizon of the majority, even of those who have made hasty overland trips, rarely reaches beyond the limits of their personal observation, and, as to the possibilities of the future, even those who have studied our past development fail to realize them. 
our imagination save in the professional boomer lags behind reasonable expectation when i told my friends that a happy accident the invitation of a generous and public-spirited friend would take me for the summer months to and through arizona two expressions were most frequent one of commiseration at my prospects of summer temperatures the other a somewhat astonished inquiry as to what a forester could find of interest in that country of cactus and desert that a large part of the territory of arizona can boast of an ideal summer climate unequalled for camping was a revelation to them and that some of the most interesting mountain forests botanically speaking are to be found there and the most lovely and most extensive as well as most economically important pineries that exist between the great forests of the pacific coast and the western border of the atlantic forest in texas and arkansas a thousand miles away in either direction this seemed to them almost incredible why should this particular forest area become a subject of investigation the question is worthy of answer here is a territory still undeveloped still undespoiled for the larger part a territory needing for its best future development not only the material which these forest areas can furnish forever but dependent on irrigation for its agricultural future and thus requiring that protection of its water sources which a forest cover is supposed to afford would it not be wisdom to study the relation of this resource to the whole development of the country and to study the conditions under which this resource could be rationally managed so as to avoid as far as practicable the devastation that has characterized our occupation of other sections and thus pave the way for a rational use of this important yet limited resource to be sure this is hardly the way we are wont to do for with regard to our resources especially our forests we take a position somewhat similar to that of the old gentleman from arkansas when it was raining he could not mend his roof and when it was not he did not need a roof anyway arizona the unknown and maligned the land of thorns and spines the province of apparently hopeless deserts and yet of rich promise the land of dreary wastes and yet of infinite variety and contrasts the territory most picturesque and full of interest to the geologist and botanist and ethnologist even to the mere sightseer and yet the least visited the earliest discovered of the western territories and yet the last to pass from the red man's dominion and the least developed the land of a high prehistoric civilization of cave-dwellers and cliff-dwellers and of the peaceful agricultural hopi and pima and yet until a decade ago terrorized by the most warlike of the indians the apache arizona is one of the most interesting of all our provinces it is curious that the health-inspiring rejuvenating quality of arizona's dry air did not impress itself upon the spanish seekers after the fount of eternal youth one of whom was destined while balked in his search for the latter to first set foot on this part of the continent alva nunez cabeza de vaca with two spaniards and one negro as companions all four fugitives by land from slavery among the seminole indians in florida and finding their way across the continent were the first to see the seven cities of cibola the hopi villages were the first to pass under the shadows of san francisco mountain and to share the hospitalities of the pima indians just three hundred sixty years ago three years later in fifteen forty an exploring expedition under vasquez de coronado visited the same country and it was then that one of his lieutenants don garcia lopez de cardenas gazed the first white man on the wonders of the grand canyon of the colorado forty years later another of the conquistadors antonio de espejo ventured forth and claimed and named the country for spain nuevo mexico under which name it came to the united states 
the portion north of gila river by the treaty of guadalupe hidalgo in 1848 the portion south of the gila by the treaty and purchase negotiated by the then minister to mexico james gadsden in 1854 for the purpose of obtaining a suitable route for a southern pacific railroad the price paid for the latter portion being ten million dollars spanish development was confined entirely to the lower portions and consisted mainly in the establishment of missions to convert the agricultural indians and in the location of presidios at tucson and tubac to protect the missions and the few haciendas and silver mines then worked the hostile apache constantly harassing their indian and spanish neighbors alike and withstanding the progress of civilization in 1863 the territory of arizona was segregated from new mexico the name probably being a modification of arizonac a papago indian name of uncertain meaning which had been applied to a native village and was extended to the lower portion of what is now our southwestern province by the spaniards the expeditions of the war department under sitgraves williamson whipple park gray beale and ives during the years from 1852 to 1860, give us the first definite knowledge of the country. Almost simultaneously with these, immigration and mining development began under protection of military forts Buchanan and Breckinridge. From 1863, when the territory was segregated from New Mexico, to 1874, the history of Arizona is written in blood. It took a hardy man to run the risk of tomahawk and scalping knife in order to benefit from the rich mineral discoveries in southern and middle Arizona. Nor were the mining communities themselves without their internal strife and shotgun administration of desperadoes and Mexican laborers. The successful campaigns of General Custer, however, broke the war spirit of the Indians and led to the Treaty of 1874, when these Indians were placed on reservations. The advent of the Southern Pacific Railroad in 1878 stimulated anew the development of the mining districts, and since the Apache Indians, with their cunning leader Geronimo, were removed to Florida in 1886, the peaceful progress of the territory is assured, and one may travel through the country with no more fear of a hold-up than in Texas or New York three centuries and three score years of history yet the beginnings of civilization and of the development of the territory date back hardly a score of years and it is only a little over a decade since a really peaceful progress has begun since the marauding apache has been removed arizona with an area of about one hundred fourteen thousand square miles equaling the combined areas of new york and the new england states or of ohio indiana and illinois is in the main a plateau rising from the southwestern corner toward the north and east from an altitude of not more than forty feet above sea level at or near yuma the plateau level rises to seven thousand feet or more and with the many mountain ranges that overtop the plateau every altitude is found up to twelve thousand eight hundred feet in the rude stone monument erected by mr gilbert on the highest peak of san francisco mountains there is however a convenient and significant altitudinal subdivision of the plateau to be noted by which the northeastern section with about one-third of the territory is segregated as the colorado plateau a part of the great plateau which extends northward with an average elevation of over four thousand feet the southwestern two-thirds forming a lower plateau with an average elevation of probably over one thousand feet studded with rugged sierras which sometimes reach up nearly ten thousand feet the division between these sections is sharp and sudden in most parts it is a line of cliffs and steep slopes varying from six hundred to one thousand two hundred feet and more in height which form a rim to the higher plateau popularly known among the mexicans as the mogollon and among americans as the rim 
this great escarpment forms so abrupt a boundary line that a stone may be hurled from one region into the other immediately below this rim there is a climatically and botanically intermediary region or transition zone which only accentuates the two main divisions the convenience of this subdivision extends beyond topographic distinction for the two sections differentiate climatically almost as abruptly as the surface giving rise from the standpoint of the visitor to a summer section and a winter section with corresponding differences in flora fauna and economic conditions thus the range of summer and winter climate which a latitudinal difference of a thousand miles effects from maine to florida is here effected approximately by altitudinal differences within a hundred miles furthermore the two sections are best reached and until a few years ago could only be approached by rail on two independent railroad systems the southern pacific affording passage through the southern region and the atlantic and pacific now part of the santa fe system traversing the northern section at present there is a connection between the two trunk lines by way of phoenix and prescott having access to the central section these three lines with a few short feeders comprise the entire railroad system of the territory the tourist starting for arizona in july will probably enter the territory by the northern route and spend the warm months on the plateau making flagstaff his headquarters or base of supplies after the hot and dreary ride over the featureless plains of western kansas and eastern colorado and through the hardly less dreary though more varied mountain scenery of new mexico and after passing through the desert country of the eastern border county of arizona containing the celebrated petrified forests strewn in huge logs over the sandy waste it is a relief when suddenly the pinon and juniper appear in dense masses and finally the pine forest is entered within an hour of reaching flagstaff to add to the feeling of comfort and new interest which this unexpected forest scene creates the grand peaks of the san francisco mountains come in sight possibly with a white veil of freshly fallen snow that vanishes before the day is over then when the heavy upgrade puffing of the engine and the rumbling of the cars cease and we alight at the terminus of the railroad journey and the beginning of our camping tour in the oddly named town flagstaff in the midst of this lovely pinery we feel at home at once without any misgivings as to the comfort or interest of the expedition coming to study the forests we are naturally attracted by the chimneys and lumber piles in the distance which suggest what becomes of the grand pines that we have just learned to admire although the sun is low the train arriving late in the afternoon the sawmills which with the cattle and sheep interests form the raison d'etre of the little settlement of one thousand five hundred people call for immediate inspection at the mills and offices we learn that of the twenty four million feet of lumber now cut in the territory annually the various sawmills of flagstaff supplied by a logging road of twenty miles produce about one half besides some two hundred thousand railroad ties supplying the local demands of the northern part of the territory and also of southern california and new mexico we learn from inspection of the yards that the pine lumber of the pine pinus ponderosa is only of medium quality yet good enough for all local uses with a lumberman's eye we have noticed that the trees cannot yield much clear timber and this impression is verified by the books of the sawmill men which show that not more than six to seven per cent of the logs reaching the mill yield first-class material and we have also noted that the cut per acre must be far below what eastern lumbermen would expect these conditions are fully realized in flagstaff the opinion of the president of the arizona lumber company conveyed to the governor of the territory and printed by him in his report for eighteen ninety three is suggestive Quote, 
I believe that it is the duty of every person who can give the matter thought and who is in position to influence anyone's action in the premises to make some endeavor to perpetuate our forest conditions for the benefit of future generations in the territory. Upon the rational use of our forests will depend the happiness and welfare, and I may say the absolute existence, of any large population in this territory, and the time to act is the present, when the least possible injury will be done to vested rights. I believe the government ought to withdraw all timber lands it possesses, and ought to appoint a competent forester, who would make it his sole duty to see that the covering which nature has afforded our mountain tops should be preserved, to the end that the valley land of the territory be protected either from droughts or floods in the years to come. End quote. The next morning we are naturally eager to start out early to climb that magnificent mountain which rises north of the little hamlet in solitary grandeur, a huge volcano whose fires have but recently been extinguished, now unique in its symmetrical and striking outlines, the most impressive feature in the landscape. The elevation of Flagstaff being about 7,000 feet, a steady ascent is made from the town for 10 or 12 miles to the foot of the cone at 8,000 feet, and then comes a steeper climb. The road is through a lovely forest of bolt pine, Pinus ponderosa, a species common from British Columbia southward, both along the Sierra Madre and the Rocky Mountains, down to Mexico. The forest is open and park-like, the trees standing in groups, with here and there an old stager which was a good-sized sapling when the first white conquistadors passed through this wilderness 360 years ago. The open stand of the stately pines rearing their heads 100 and more feet into the remarkably blue sky naturally causes the formation of a long and rather symmetrical crown, which adds to the scenic beauty but not to the commercial value of the timber. Since the rainy season has not yet set in, there is but little grass and lower vegetation visible, hardly any undergrowth impedes the view, yet here and there a clump of the scrubby rocky mountain white oak, Quereus gambelii, forms a pleasing contrast. As we reach an altitude of 9,000 feet, a change of scene occurs. The yellow-green, heavy-foliaged bull pine is supplanted by the graceful, dark-green white pine of the Rockies, Pinus flexilis, and the still more striking Douglas spruce, which in scattered individuals studs the now really grassy slope, for at this higher altitude more moisture and less evaporation favor the grassy growth. One thousand feet higher, and we reach the region of the foxtail pine, P. aristata, well named for the long flexible branchlets closely beset at their ends with crowded needles exhibit strikingly the appearance of a foxtail as we ascend the engelmann spruce as widely distributed over the west as the bull pine joins these trees and with them forms a more or less dense forest the trunks short and much branched and gnarly of little or no economic value here we find also in a few individuals a beautiful fir, a new accession to our flora, which Dr. Merriam has this summer described as the Arizona cork fir, Abies arizonica, from specimens gathered on this very trip from this very tree. At 11,500 feet, the last Engelmann spruce, tousled and shorn by the wintry blasts at this high elevation, and low creeping junipers denote timber line. Toward the northeast we look down into what was once an enormous volcano, one side blown out. The three peaks are still above us. A short climb of a thousand feet more over large blocks of lava or gravelly detritus brings us to the top of Humphreys Peak. From here the eye sweeps over a goodly portion of the northern part of the territory and the vast expanse of the pine land can be traced. Towards the north stretches the Coconino Forest, flanking the Grand Canyon, whose sheer walls on the opposite side are dimly discerned. Eastward and northeastward, 
the color of the clouds indicates the position of the painted desert separated from the san francisco forest by a fringe of junipers and pinions at the level between six thousand and seven thousand feet toward the south and southeast far as the eye can imagine sight to the mogollon and white mountains and westward beyond the three-peaked landmark of bill williams mountain and mount sitgreaves stretches the sea of pines covering altogether an area of not less than three thousand square miles it is proper that we should give full consideration to san francisco mountains for not only are they among the most picturesque and interesting to the sightseer geologist and plant geographer but they are of importance economically not merely for the pasturage that might be gleaned from their slopes or for their timber which on the higher levels is not worth the cutting but for their meteorological effect which is increased by the forest cover their peaks arrest and precipitate the clouds which would otherwise pass over the plateau and find no cause for precipitation over the eastward desert nuva tiki obi home of the high snows is the name the indians gave to them they form the only elevation in arizona on which snows can and do accumulate giving up their stores in spring furnishing supplies for many springs and washes and to at least one perennial stream oak creek from this consideration it would be proper to make into a forest reservation all the area above the level of eight thousand five hundred feet we may take our descent on the western face of the mountain passing one of the loveliest spots where a never falling spring of cold delicious water invites us to camp among the aspen growth which intermingles with the spruces and white pines and we may also extend our excursion to pay a brief visit to walker lake or to crater lake whose yawning mouth once spouting molten masses is now sealed by a sheet of water a welcome find to the cattle herds roaming over the plateau to pick the sometimes scanty herbage water even on the plateau is the only deficiency of the whole territory not that there is not sufficient and even too much at times but in its distribution it is uncertain and extreme both by localities and by seasons and even within the rainy season the dry air makes constant and excessive demands here as in the southern portion of arizona there are two wet seasons winter and summer on the plateau after the beautiful days of indian summer in november winter begins with christmas while mostly clear and calm with temperatures rarely below twenty two degrees at night ranging to fifty degrees or sixty degrees in the day snows come every ten to fourteen days to a depth of four to twenty four inches drifting badly but rarely lying long except on the higher levels and even the frozen ground becomes soft in the middle of the day spring begins about the middle of april and is the dry season windy dusty the first half cooler the last half warmer than one would wish with the first week of july the rainy season sets in lasting until september with it comes the profusion of flowers which is characteristic of the rocky mountains and which by and by will fill the pine woods below with gay beauty and luxuriance whole fields of the blue flag iris versicolor bloom there are magnificent carmine gilias and penstemons the dark purple and golden primula parigi the yellow columbine and a host of others changing off through the season and making this plateau a veritable flower garden the rains hardly ever come as land rains but their nature and quantity are very variable a short shower each afternoon is said to be the regulation rain but the season of eighteen ninety five excelled in terrific downpours with most boisterous thundering and brilliant lightning not even respecting the nightly rest of the tentless camper yet the dry air soon obliterates the dampness the temperature however is kept at a most delightful uniform degree never much about seventy five degrees or eighty degrees and the sunsets after a late thunderstorm are the most gorgeous to be seen anywhere the nights are cool toward morning occasionally even cold 
Altogether, the summer climate in the pines is ideal. While preparing for our trip of exploration, there are many points of interest around Flagstaff to visit. We may descend into Cosnino or Walnut Canyon, a deep, narrow cut with its long rows of cliff dwellings built into the limestone walls, reminding us of bygone millenniums, when a teeming population must have lived here. These dry ridges and plateau portions are wooded with the low trees, rarely over thirty feet high, often shrub-like in form, of the pinion or nut pine, Pinus edulis, whose sweet seeds are gathered for food by the Indians, and the western juniper, Juniperus utahensis, fit only for firewood, interspersed with shrubs of striking form and foliage, almost always spiny and of peculiar interest. Among these are the pink-flowered locust, the yellow-flowered prickly-leaved barberry, the fruit-making excellent jam, the trifoliate red-fruited squawberry of delicious acid taste, and the snowy white-tufted cliff rose, which is not a rose at all, yet fills the air with a rare fragrance. An inspection of the logging operations gives an opportunity to make measurements of the rate of growth of the pines and to observe the differences in their development, giving rise to the lumberman's classification into jack pines, the younger or quickly grown, and yellow pines, the older or slowly grown, which are from 250 to 300 years and more old. Presently we start southward. Looking back on the hospitable town of Flagstaff and its grand mountain and forest entourage, across the waste which the logger and the unavoidable forest fire have made, and the natural prairie or glade south of it. Such glades, from a few acres to several square miles in extent, are a very general and interesting phenomenon throughout these woods, furnishing not only most pleasing vistas, but opportunity for pasturage and agricultural use. Their soil is usually rich black loam washed from the surrounding hills, rather compact and liable to a wide range of moisture conditions on account of deficient drainage, and hence inimical to tree growth, but readily supporting a greensward of grass. In wet seasons, these depressions sometimes turn into lakes. Mormon Lake, which we pass, is such a prairie, some five miles long and one to two miles wide, which, when the Mormons arrived there, had the appearance of a rich meadow, inducing them to settle and go into dairy farming. After a few years the glade filled up with water and became a lake. In 1895 it was all dry except a small remnant of water in the lowest depression. As these patches of fertile land, forming about 15 to 20 percent of the forested area, are destined to become objects of agricultural development, they have begun to be so used, and in that way to be helpful in the rational management of the surrounding forest country, it would be of interest to experiment as to their best treatment, many of them by judicious ditching, by which the moisture extremes may be abated, can undoubtedly be made to produce various crops besides the potato and alfalfa or oats which the short season and the cold condition of the soil now permit. As we proceed, we presently pass a most forbidding spot where the limestone soil is covered with black blocks of lava, giving rise to soils locally known as malapai, corrupted from the Spanish mal pais, bad lands although the soil is not so bad after all, at least for tree growth. One of the great lava fields of the world, made up of basalt and trachyte, extends from San Francisco mountains southward and northward, covering fully 20,000 square miles with its overflow. As we progress through the forest, we learn from the differences of soils and consequent differences in development of the trees something of the geology of this plateau. Archaean, Silurian, Carboniferous, Juratrius, Cretaceous, and Igneous rocks are found. Three soil formations are readily recognized, limestone here, sandstone there, and over both, irregularly, the decomposed beds of lava which have overflowed thousands of square miles, giving rise to the Malapai. 
so far as tree growth is concerned wherever the decomposition of the lava blocks has been thorough and limestones have added their quota the soil is by no means unfavorable the limestone soils seem to produce the best timber the sandstone soils the poorest water is to be found in springs only at rare intervals and hence camping places must be known yet the few wells which have been dug here and there furnishing deliciously cool and good water suggest that the development of water resources could be extended as we become familiar with the woods and observe how the trees always stand in groups with open spaces between and how the young growths from the seedling to the sapling also occur only in groups and patches and as we lie in our tentless bed in an open spot where neither cones nor caterpillars can drop on us and ponder over the reasons for this aspect of tree distribution we come to the conclusion that water conditions or soil conditions affected by drainage must account for it those portions of the rocky and unevenly disintegrated soil which permit a temporary storage of sufficient moisture at the proper season will alone reproduce and permit the young growth to thrive another interesting observation regarding these pine forests is that young growth seems to appear only in irregular periods from three to ten years intervening between the groups of young trees after a fortnight's progress of the rainy season millions of little seedlings spring up all through the wood carrying their seed shells in characteristic manner above ground a rich promise of a dense young aftergrowth yet probably all doomed to perish from frost because the short season does not permit the ripening of their wood the reproduction to be permanent must take place in the spring induced by a wet winter and spring season which occurs only at considerable intervals the farther south we progress on our journey the denser statelier and more valuable grows the pine forest undisturbed as yet by the hand of man presently we emerge from its shady recesses and as we pass the last pines a candelabrum of flaming red and yellow lights a century plant in bloom messenger of warmer climes that has found its way up along a canyon from the lower levels tells us that soon we shall be in the region of cactus yucca and cat's claw if we had time we would visit those picturesque red rocks which loom up in the west forming the canyons of oak creek the perennial daughter of san francisco mountains the clearest mountain stream in this entire region in its upper part famed for beautiful trout pools in its middle part hardly known to even the nearest neighbors and not at all to the outside world it affords the most romantic and most picturesque rock country imaginable the celebrated garden of the gods in colorado being an insignificant imitation only the manifold curious wind-carved shapes of the red sandstone rocks rising abruptly from the ground contrasted with the green of the surrounding plain are worth a long journey to see the few who have visited this secluded valley will also not forget the remarkable bouquet and aroma of the grape raised by one of the most enterprising ranchers on these sun-warmed sand bottoms which promises some day to outrank the finest vintage of bordeaux end of section three section four of the national geographic magazine volume eight july august eighteen ninety seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by avai in june two thousand eighteen the forests and deserts of arizona continued presently a wide view opens before our eyes far below us stretches verd valley and we are looking over the rim into the borderland of the southern desert region in red and white and yellow and brown tints glare the arid gravels studded thinly with a scant shrubby vegetation dry and gray 
the fresh bright green spots that catch the eye we find afterward to be groups of opuntias large prickly pears whose red acid fruit we appreciate later in the season after we have learned how to avoid the prickles which almost invisibly cover them in small tufts among the trees the first we meet is a peculiar leafless shrub-like form with long slender green branches the falsely so-called palo verde canotia holacanta of the botanists the majority of the shrubs of the brush desert belong to the acacia tribe all with symmetrically rounded heads and like every other plant here provided with thorns or spines the peculiar adaptation to desert conditions making the labors of the collector a hard task many unfamiliar plant forms excite the curiosity of the newcomer we have suddenly dropped to the three thousand foot level and begin to feel the difference in temperature the canteen is often called into requisition by and by the heat of the early afternoon sun leads us to wish that camp were near uncertain of the road we ascend one of the glaring white limestone hills and lo what an unexpected sight meets our eye the contrast is so great that we think a mirage must have been risen to mock our heated brain there lies at our feet stretching away for several miles a land of green vegetation rich and luscious as in the most favoured spots of the allegians in early summer a broad river of foliage interrupted here and there by fields of alfalfa and corn with orchards from which the red roofs peep out hospitably we are looking into the valley of beaver creek one of the affluents of rio verde which like all these watercourses hidden away under a dense cover of deciduous trees are the surprises of the deserts through which they flow and furnish the water for the irrigated fields of the rancher here we find not only the cottonwoods hackberry and ash of several species as along the streams of the more eastern plains but a tree alder of excellent shape peculiar to arizona and a plain or sycamore much more striking and beautiful in its foliage than those which are planted in our eastern streets and parks there is the same tangle of luxuriant vegetation with grapevines trailing over bushes and trees that we find in the bottom lands of our gulf states with rock and debris and driftwood and sand carried by the flood waters of the stream which comes from the pine plateau the forest watering the plain down in this bower of green a real paradise after the weary desert ride we gladly camp and enjoy a refreshing bath in the soda springs in addition to the creek and these interesting soda springs there is a still more remarkable sheet of water to be found in the well-known montezuma well a deep hole in the limestone hills probably originally a large limestone cave the roof of which fell in when the water collected in it here also we find reminders of the cliff dwellers who a thousand years ago or more built their abodes in the walls of this huge well and used its never failing water which passes through a subterranean tunnel into the creek to irrigate their fields as do the ranchers of today not only the line of the ancient ditch has been found clearly defined but the petrified ditch itself has been dug out the lime of the water having completely filled the original ditch with its deposit a thrifty agricultural population with whom agriculture and especially horticulture evidently pays has now taken the place of these prehistoric tillers of the soil who have left the signs of their existence and their activity everywhere through the territory in more or less preserved ruins the largest and most elaborate of which named montezuma castle probably because of its size and elaborateness is found not many miles from montezuma well little is known of these prehistoric people but after seeing the present abodes and ways of the hopi and zunyi indians there remains but little doubt in our minds that the ancients were the ancestors of these natives perhaps not so many centuries removed 
and observing that these cliff dwellings are as a rule situated near or overlooking agriculturally available grounds and recalling the history of the apache raids we conclude that they were agricultural indians driven to construct their dwellings in inaccessible places for defense against their enemies resuming our journey a few miles bring us to verde the abandoned military post known as camp verde where two thousand of the wild apaches surrendered to general crook in eighteen eighty three then and there breaking the war spirit of the race which had harassed for centuries peaceful indians and white settlers alike except in the irrigated valley everything looks brown and sere and uncompromising under the july sun the cattle industry used to thrive in this valley as in many others of the territory and also on the plateau but just like lumbering in other regions it was carried on recklessly the natural meadows being overstocked far beyond their capacity so that large areas which twelve years ago were luxuriant grass producers are now absolutely barren with not a spear of grass visible the broad valley of rio verde which carries the drainage from the plateau to salt river is capable of agricultural development to a much greater extent than has been attempted but as in other parts of the territory this requires systematic storage and utilization of the water by careful management the cattle sheep and goat industry would no doubt be able to use advantageously the large non-irrigable areas the home market for this secluded valley is mainly in jerome which is the seat of one of the largest copper mines and reduction works in the united states with an annual output of about one million dollars in value prescott and the mining districts surrounding it are also within reach by a long day's ride there is hardly a drearier ride to be imagined than that from verde valley over the black hills to prescott up and down hill over dry ridges studded with chaparral scrub oak manzanita and the like we traverse a region for which but for the mineral wealth that may be underground no use suggests itself arriving at prescott we reach once more the altitude of the pines in bradshaw mountains but we find that there is little timber left the town and the mining districts surrounding it having used up most of it prescott was once the capital of the territory and is still the metropolis of central arizona the supply base of many outlying mining districts and the cattle ranches in the large valleys on the north and west here we may take train for the southern portion of the territory a branch road starts from ash fork on the atlantic and pacific railroad whence it passes through the black forest not of spruces firs and pines like the celebrated forest of that name in germany but of sombre low-topped cedars and pinon the road running over trestles and loops to get from the plateau into the valley passing southward from prescott on this line we traverse a rugged dry mountain country which contains rich mining ground where a man may wash his day's wages in gold from the soil anywhere in the creek bottoms or canyons deficiency of water alone retards this mining development yet some large mines are worked by pumping water six and eight miles over the mountain as we descend into the plain from the six thousand foot level of prescott the temperature seemingly rises in geometric ratio and as we reach the plain at about one thousand two hundred feet we begin to suspect our friends were right after all in commiserating our fate we reach phoenix at night and the broad waters of salt river in the moonlight at least suggest coolness and the night warm enough to sleep outdoors does indeed afford relief from the excessive heat of the day when the thermometer was at one hundred ten degrees the southern portion of arizona can be subdivided into two sections fairly well differentiated topographically climatically and economically the eastern district is elevated and mountainous it is bounded on the west by the high mountain ranges of santa rita el rincon santa catalina and tortilla and superstition mountains 
the western part is a vast desert plain out of which like islands from the sea rise abruptly in parallel lines ten to thirty miles apart in black and purplish hues rugged and towering granite mountains reflecting the sun's rays with dazzling brilliancy these mountains are mostly devoid of vegetation and mostly also of soil awful in their barrenness while the desert below may be just as barren in places or else is studded with the sparse vegetation of cacti agave yucca cat's claws palo verde mesquite etc a paradise of spines and thorns there would appear on general principles nothing more depressing than such a country so it is when viewed from the car window yet as a matter of fact to the explorer it is full of interest a stimulus to the curiosity and furnishing real entertainment and finally much of this hopeless desert promises to the future many a paying enterprise not only do the desert mountain ranges contain minerals of value gold and silver and others while salt borax gypsum sulphur asbestos kaolin and pumice stone may be found in the plain but the soil is capable of producing profusely in this southern clime if only water can be brought to it water is the great problem here the little rain that falls over the vast region fills the watercourses where there are any for only a few hours after which what is not evaporated sinks into the loose sand and the river continues underground the bed above running dry yet as to the possibility of finding enough water to irrigate the most of it who will foretell there are really only two rivers which run always full the colorado and the gila while gila river and its affluents the san pedro salt and Tazayampa, which run dry occasionally furnish only a limited quantity the mighty colorado river carries a volume of water not only six times as rich in fertility as that of the nile but of almost limitless and continuous supply which would suffice to irrigate several million acres to be sure the bed lies considerably below the level of the plain yet when the economic conditions of the country require it there will be no difficulty in devising the mechanical means to bring this water upon the land as is being done now in a small way at yuma and with the addition of artesian wells perhaps it may only be a question of time when these dreary wastes will be turned into fertile fields and gardens such as are beginning to grow up around phoenix yuma and other cities a revival of bygone times when an ancient and industrious people occupied the gila bottom lands of whose existence now only the ruins of long fallen towns the remnants of large aqueducts and widely distributed fragments of pottery testify phoenix the capital already boasts of being a garden spot all owing to the extensive irrigation canal system which derives its waters from salt river and certainly the green alfalfa fields and extensive orchards of peach and almond olive and pomegranate are a most pleasing contrast to the surrounding cheerless brush desert the city embowered in the tropic foliage of palms and pepper trees with its luxurious hotels is bound to become nay has already become a mecca of the seeker after a mild winter climate and relief from pulmonary complaints while its summer temperatures may be said to lack nothing in generosity for eight months in the year the climate is said to be perfect the eastern mountain region is mainly a pasturing region the valleys are clothed with hardy grass and stunted acacias while the mountains when over six thousand feet high and massive enough to induce precipitation are wooded the drier exposures and lower altitudes support an open growth of stubby live oaks the trees varying in height from twelve to rarely over twenty-five feet which in the distance have the appearance of an old apple or cart higher above the six thousand foot level and reaching to the tops at ten thousand feet at most the pines appear including several most interesting species which are at home further south in mexico 
together with some of more northern nativity. In these mountains, within a day's ride from Tucson, we may find the most lovely cool recesses of a trout stream, either in the Santa Catalina Mountains, or, with a few hours of railroad added, in the Chiricahua Range, where we may readily forget that we are in the driest and hottest, erroneously so believed, portion of the United States. Here, at the higher elevations among the pines, the air is most delightful, and while the days are just about right, the nights may, even in September, be frosty enough for a double blanket. Tucson, being 2,400 feet above sea level at the eastern border of the desert, is the rival of Phoenix, not indeed with regard to agricultural development, for this old presidio of the Spaniard placed there to protect the mission of San Xavier among the Papago Indians, still in existence, lies high and dry beyond sufficient water supplies, unless some time artesian wells may be developed. But it is, or will be, a rival as a health resort, excelling the capital in the conditions and quality of the air, helpful in pulmonary diseases. Returning to the plateaus of northern Arizona, there are two trips which we must take together from Flagstaff, for without them a visit to the territory is decidedly incomplete. One, two, and through the painted desert to the villages of the Hopi Indians, the other to the Grand Canyon. Having heard that within three days the celebrated snake dance is to take place at Oraibi, one of the Hopi villages one hundred miles northward, we get ready our camp outfit for a plunge into the desert. Once more we skirt the San Francisco mountains, which will remain our guide and landmark through the whole trip, visible at any time and to the last. Once more we pass through the pine forest and over the black lava sands of the juniper and pinion belt, coming out on the rocky limestone plateau with its scanty pasture and low shrub growth. Water is scarce on this trip, and although spring wells and so-called tanks, clayey soil depressions and rock cavities in which rainwaters collect, may be found at distances of 25 to 40 miles apart, it is safer to carry water in the approved fashion. We reach the river, the Colorado Chiquito, or Little Colorado, marked in the distance by the line of cottonwoods, on the morning of the second day and find its bed, which is usually dry, filled to the brim with a yellow loam puddle, a rushing torrent. We should have to camp here until the flood abates, but for the enterprise of a trader who has spanned the river with a steel cable, by means of which we transfer our packs, swimming our horses. Now we have in truth entered a desert, such as we have met nowhere else in the territory. The scene is one of utter desolation. Not a tree or a shrub breaks the monotony of the flat tableland. Here it is eroded into deep, dark, vari-coloured green, blue and yellow-brown ravines and chasms. They are overtopped by high mesas with flaming red edges, the sands reflecting the sun's rays in a white and yellow glare, and the white summer clouds in turn reflecting not only the heat, but the colours of the desert. In the distance peculiarly shaped purplish peaks and pinnacles and solitary butts mark the limit of the desert proper, and our destination two days hence, while now and then a mirage brings into view a sheet of water so distinct and natural that in spite of our knowledge of the immaterial nature of the apparition, our eyes refuse to accept the reasoning of our minds. Now and then we pass over different soils, alkali in nature, and still more forbidding than the sand. Then again heavy loam soils with scant brush growth. If there ever was a region which would be thought beyond the possibilities of useful occupation, you would think that this was the one. And yet, as we reached the trading post of the enterprising German, whose cable helped us over the river, we are as ready to distrust our eyes believing to see a mirage as when we found ourselves deceived in the phantasmal lakes, but there certainly seem to be green cornfields. We are not, however, deceived. There is real corn of various kinds, 
and sugar-cane and potatoes and other garden truck not less than forty acres in cultivation right in the sand and without irrigation listen to what the enterprising cultivator writes of his success in the first year's experiment Quote, our crop has furnished us eighty tons of hay and fodder sugar-cane did the best eight feet high corn the old indian variety has done well watermelons onions and sweet potatoes seem to be at home here and all that without a drop of rain for eighteen months our trial plantings have fully paid us now we have a lake here made by construction of a mud dam across a dry wash and filled by the floods from the upper country one by one and a half miles in extent and twenty feet deep the reservoir was filled about september fifteen and has lowered until now january third hardly fifteen inches irish potatoes were small but perhaps would have made good-sized tubers but that they were drowned yet we caught ducks in return which we shot from our boat the cottonwoods planted have done well expect to plant ten thousand this spring there are a million acres around me which can do the same End quote. how is it possible you ask without water it is due to the moisture held in storage from occasional rains and drainage by the sand whose structure prevents its evaporation as well as its sinking away who will foretell the possibilities of the future after this experience we are not surprised to find further on the cornfields of the navajo indians on the sandiest sites much more primitive to be sure and when we reach the village of oraibi the thrifty fields small garden patches and peach orchards show that these sands and dry deserts can yet support a goodly population here we are at last after a weary ride over the sand and through the cornfields and bean patches of the hopi indians called moki by alien tribes in opprobrium and by some whites through objectionable imitation at the base of a precipitous mesa perched on which three hundred feet above stands oraibi one of the seven cities of sibola where for hundreds perhaps thousands of years the original race of indians have lived peacefully closely packed in their stone houses there can be no more picturesque sight than this town with its inhabitants clad in blankets of bright colors grouped on the tops of the gray limestone houses watching the snake dance nor is there anything more fascinating than to watch these ceremonies there is hardly a more promising field for ethnological study than these primitive house builders and agriculturists but they are foreign to our chief subject and we can only glance at a few features in rapid succession this has been a festive time and hence the usual filth has been in part removed and a general house cleaning and cleaning of hair and body has taken place so that inspection of the dwellings which the good-natured children of nature rather court is comparatively satisfactory the wealthier householders have even whitewashed their houses outside and inside and their stores of corn are in shipshape order the ceremonies of the snake dance last nine days in all partly in public partly in their secret temples where as a rule only the priests of the two orders the antelope and snake are admitted today is the last day and the snake dance is at the end of the ceremonies the purport of which is to bring rain for the suffering crops the antelope priests painted masked and decorated coming from their kiva in single file perform a rhythmic round march and place themselves on guard before the snake hut made of cottonwood boughs in which the reptile partners to the dance are placed the snake priests perform the same round march and then placed in rows opposite each other the two lines begin a low incantation accompanied by rhythmic motions in unison sidewise to and fro weird is their song weird are their looks and weird their motions but weirder still are these when their wriggling writhing partners enter the circle and the round march with the snakes begins 
For this the snake priests divide into sets of three, the carrier holding the reptile, venomous or not, and in full possession of its fangs, between its teeth, and rhythmically swinging its curling body, the charmer following him, with eagle feathers stroking the hair and shoulder of the carrier, or else his burden, while the catcher trips on the outside, ready to pick up with unfailing accuracy the reptile. When it has done its service, it is laid on the ground and darts away for liberty. The dexterity with which this act is performed, the man taking time to first strew the sacred meal and apply the charm of eagle brush to the escaping rattler, makes the catcher the hero of the hour. When all these twenty or thirty reptiles have thus passed through the right, it only remains to carry them toward the north, south, east and west, whence they came, and set them free, unhurt, for they are the personified spirits of ancestors, who have in the ceremony been induced to intercede with the deities. The result of the prayer for rain, which is the purport of the whole ceremony, seemed to follow immediately in a most tremendous downpour, which turned the dry wash at which we are encamped into a raging torrent sixty feet wide and five feet deep. This result, however, was promptly disclaimed by the snake priests, for their prayer is for gentle rain, a drizzle, as it were, which they rarely get. But we must hurry away for our last trip, the one by which we shall always remember Arizona, if all else be forgotten, the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. A flying stage from Flagstaff brings us in a long day's ride, yet not a dreary one, through the pine woods past San Francisco Mountain, again through the cedars, open over mesas and through pine woods, once more to a neat tent city, a hotel establishment well fitted to its surroundings and well kept, nestled in a depression among the stately pines close to the canyon. We are within a hundred steps of the object of our visit, but there is no indication of its presence, nothing but commonplace landscapes, albeit in the lovely setting of the shady pine boughs. We ascend the slope, unsuspecting what it is that makes people who have seen it so unreasonably effusive when speaking of it, and then suddenly the sight bursts upon us, the earth has sunk away at our feet to illimitable depths. The first sensation is one of awe and bewilderment, a shock, a sense of oppression, perhaps of horror, overpowers you. There is nothing you have seen before that has given you even a hint of what this is, nothing you can compare it to. It is an innovation in nature which it takes time to comprehend, to appreciate. Then, as you gaze, grows on you a realization of the enormousness, the gorgeousness, the weirdness, the grandeur, majesty, and sublimity of the scene. Speechless you gaze on the vast sea of ghostly giant shapes, and are overcome by the feeling of your own insignificance as in the presence of infinity. Only gradually are you made fully conscious that you behold the most sublime of all earthly spectacles. No picture has ever conveyed an idea, language there is none that can ever give an adequate conception of the ensemble of this great chasm, its vast proportions, its intricate plan, the nobility of its architecture, its colossal butts, its wealth of ornamentation, the splendor of its rich colors. It is not a canyon at all that you see. The word belittles the scene. It is a labyrinth of an infinite number of chasms and canyons that press themselves upon your view all at once, a mighty mountain country filled with most fantastically carved, gigantic rock masses, Cyclopean castles thousands of feet in height, gracefully towering Gothic cathedrals, round-topped Moslem mosques, Greek and Indian temples, frowning rock cities, pyramids and obelisks, battlemented fortresses, all the wonders of the Arabian nights multiplied and heaped together in a wild chaos, stimulating your fancy beyond its power. 
and not only is the ensemble present the most stupendous sight even the least imposing portions of the canyon are as impressive as any scenery that can be found in the world for two hundred miles of the river bed with a breadth of ten to twelve miles and more is here revealed the interior of the workshop of nature and the secrets of the building up of our earth's crust the surrounding plateau country is scored by intricate mazes of side canyons in these and in the main chasm to a depth of six thousand to eight thousand feet geological history is exhibited in precipitous walls with a clearness unparalleled in any portion of the world telling of aeons of rock building and of millenniums of rock carving by wind and water far below hardly recognizable if at all visible from above flows the great river which in its ceaseless rush has carried to the sea the sands and debris results of the denudation of more recent formations has cut through the pale grey limestones of the permian the pink and brilliant red sandstones and the purplish and vermilion limestones of the triassic the deep brown rocks of the carboniferous down to the sombre iron-black granites of the silurian and archaean ages through which the river now rolls its yellow waters gathered from thousands of square miles in the mountains of colorado and the plateaus of utah and arizona here in placid and majestic dignity there with a wild current in roaring rapids over boulders and rocks and precipitous falls great as is the fame of the grand canyon of the colorado the half remains to be told wrote major dutton in 1881 in his superb monograph on the canyon and this is still true today and will be for many years while its geology has been unfathomed with considerable detail by that philosophical geologist we have but fragmentary knowledge of its flora and fauna and we have hardly yet dared to think of its undiscovered wealth of minerals and its other economic possibilities we arrive at the brink on sunday night a thunderstorm has left a deep black nimbus a dense glowing sheet in the sky to the east on which two beacon lights appear the bases of an unfinished rainbow standing straight like two sentinels on each rim of the canyon to the west the sinking sun paints the horizon in deep crimson surrounded with a golden glory each one a cluster of small black clouds while in the north a wild yellow hail cloud casts its lurid glare it was in this setting that through rising mists in purplish hues the mystery of the canyon awful in the utter stillness revealed itself to us a thought of god on earth expressed all meaner thoughts expelling whatever may become of arizona in the future it will always be known to the world as the country of the grand canyon the wonderland of the southwest end of section four section five of the national geographic magazine volume eight july to august eighteen ninety seven this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b mount st helens by lieutenant charles p elliot u s a in going by steamer from portland oregon to vancouver washington on a clear day it is possible to see from the pilot house five snow-capped mountains hood jefferson adams rainier and st helens the last mentioned is more to the west than the others and has the appearance of a regular inverted cone truncated and rounded off the mountain presents this same appearance from all sides when the observer is at any distance two seasons spent on this extinct volcano have enabled the writer to get a general idea of the effects of volcanic action on the local geography and to make a topographic map of the district since it is within plain view of many prominent points astronomically established 
it seems strange that mount st helens should not be accurately placed on any map which the writer has examined either as to its own position or relatively as regards the other snow-clad peaks mount st helens lies east of vancouver barracks north of lewis river west of the columbia and south of the cowlitz it is west of the divide of the cascade range even more to the west than mount rainier from rough triangulation based on recent surveys the writer's map shows the summit to be in the northeast corner of township eight north range five east of the willamette meridian and its altitude taken on a clear still day with an excellent aneroid is eight thousand six hundred eight feet the approach to the mountain is by wagon road up the north fork of lewis river to the foot of the trail to lake merrill around the lake to and across the kalama river up the kalama for a short distance then toward and by goat mountain and in a northeasterly direction to what is known as butte camp at an elevation of three thousand seven hundred feet from this point horses can be taken to the bench above but there is no water and but little wood and butte camp is the proper place from which to climb the mountain unless you are thoroughly familiar with the very rough country around the base formerly the approach was from lewis river four miles above the trail to lake merrill and up a continuous run of lava sloping gradually up from the river to butte camp a rough hard trail in many places over broken lava mount st helens is not difficult of ascent and is probably the least dangerous of any of the snow-clad mountains of the cascade range in going from lewis river the trail leads up a steep hill rising nine hundred feet in two miles and then drops down one hundred feet when you most unexpectedly find yourself on the south edge of a small lake about two miles from lake merrill without any apparent reason for its existence on going to the northern end of the lake you find a mass of lava extending entirely across the axis of what was originally a mild canyon there are a few small streams flowing into lake merrill but there is no visible outlet the difference between high and low water is more than thirty feet the rainfall in autumn and spring and the snowfall in winter are very great and the fall in the level of the lake at the close of the spring rains is much too great to be accounted for by evaporation on a very still day during september eighteen ninety five i searched carefully at the north end of the lake and found in the sandy bottom about fifty yards from the shore a deep funnel-shaped hole evidently the beginning of the outlet further to the north and toward the kalama river where the lava flowed over the standing trees the places of the trunks now forming wells in the lava running water can be heard and with a strong cord and bucket drawn up still nearer the kalama a bold stream breaks out of the lava and flows into the river just below a beautiful fall formed by the kalama flowing over the edge of the same run of lava that dammed up the waters of lake merrill the space between the lake and river on the north is comparatively level the lava in many places being covered with soil and that with a heavy growth of timber where the sand and ashes predominate the growth is poor the flow of lava volcanic sand etc that ends at lake merrill and the falls of the kalama starts from the west and southwest sides of mount st helens flows against the green buttes and neighboring hills almost filling up the space between these elevations and the mountains passes around the buttes unites and fills in between goat mountain and the high ridge northeast of it forming a swampy meadow at the base of goat mountain the waters of which are strongly impregnated with iron while to the south of the ridge runs a clear cold stream coming from the lava at cold springs and joined by a second stream coming from the snow directly west of the summit to the south from green buttes the country is filled in until checked by a semicircle of hills that turn to the west and extend south of the kalama river a small lake fills the level space between the hills the kalama river bursts as a full-fledged stream 
bubbling up like a fountain from the southwest side of the more northerly hill flows south to the lake then turns to the north of west flowing at first through willows and swampy ground then gradually gains strength and cuts down in the volcanic sand and boulders on its north bank the high ridge being to the south finally near where the trail crosses the river it cuts through the volcanic formation and ends by leaving all the volcanic deposit on the south side a spur from goat mountain forming its north bank when the river tumbles over the falls it leaves the volcanic formation and runs through a growth of fine timber to the columbia river at the town of kalama except where lava and bedrock are exposed the country below the level of five thousand feet is covered with a dense growth of timber and brush to the east of the head of kalama river is a run of lava that starts near the summit of st helens and extends with a nearly uniform slope to the north fork of lewis river this lava has filled up the country in its course flowing around hills as a river around islands about two miles from the river it has crossed the course of a small stream forming during the wet season a large pond with an underground outlet sufficient to carry off the flow of the stream during the dry months and the excess due to rain and snow after the dry season sets in the water from the pond and stream finds its way into the lewis river under the surface of the lava east of the lava run is a bold stream with several branches some coming from the snow and some from a swamp east of south from the mountains the black lava spreads out like a fan on this side where it stops the slopes are covered with boulders and as the high ground to the south arrests the flow of volcanic sand etc and is filled in a comparatively level swamp is formed with streams flowing into big creek on one side and pine creek on the other northeast of the lava and nearly due east of the summit the most considerable glacier on the mountain is found the glacial stream issuing from it flows through the boulders ashes pumice stone etc as a dirty stream for about three miles when it sinks with high banks of volcanic sand on both sides but soon appears as a clear stream between very high white sand banks until within a few miles of lewis river where the volcanic deposits disappear going to the northeast and across pine creek you find a succession of buttes that form the watershed between pine creek and the big muddy and also act as a barrier for the sand and pumice stone now very plentiful that has formed a nearly level and barren plateau between the base of the mountain cone and the tops of the buttes two small streams one clear the other muddy run gently over the level and having joined pitch over the steep slope and join the big muddy to the north of the hills a third stream flows down from the ice and snow and finds its way also to the big muddy northeast of the mountain the deposit of sand ashes and pumice stone is greater than on any other side this deposit passing to the north and keeping west of the high ground of the original formation has formed a dam across a canyon and the result has been spirit lake a deep and quite considerable body of water the outlet over the dam is known as Toutle river following down Toutle river from the lake the flow at first is very gentle then a shallow pond is formed about a quarter of a mile long and below that the stream gets more rapid but remains clear until about two miles below the lake where a muddy stream comes in from the mountain one mile further down a second stream comes in from near the base of the mountain leaving the river on what is called the spirit lake trail through dense underbrush and pine thickets you pass below the lower edge of a run of lava from the northeast side of the mountain and across a swamp formed as before by volcanic agencies also across two small streams from springs below the lava and climbing steadily up over ground covered with boulders and heavy timber the edge of the canyon of the south Toutle is reached the north side of the canyon is of fine white sand and is very steep and hard to climb the south Toutle flows from under a glacier 
in plain view and runs in a bed of boulders directly toward the point where the trail first strikes the edge of the canyon then turns more to the west and with a constantly widening bed of sand and rocks filling the original canyon to a width of a half mile or more the stream flows sometimes on one side sometimes on the other the water occasionally forms a dam in one of its temporary beds among the rocks and having gathered sufficient head bursts the dam and comes down bringing large boulders with it after leaving the south toutle and passing over high ground a second and smaller canyon is crossed with a bold stream running from the mountain into south toutle then up to a high bench and down to cold springs which crops out under the lava and flows toward goat mountain and finally into toutle river the circuit of the mountain on the lower levels is now complete at the summit of the mountain the highest point is bare rock south of east and also north of east are two other bare points the intervening space is covered with snow and between the two easterly points the largest glacier issues from which pine creek runs almost directly north of the head of this glacier and across the northern point of rocks the second glacier begins the water from it flowing into the north toutle and northwest of the highest point is the third glacier the source of the south toutle snow falls to a great depth over all this country in winter but in early summer the warm rains and hot sun melt the snow very rapidly and the black lava on the mountain to its very summit is exposed in streaks radiating from a common center end of section five section six of the national geographic magazine volume eight july august eighteen ninety seven this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Geographic Literature Magnetic Declination in the United States by Henry Gannett From the 17th Annual Report of the U.S. Geological Survey, Washington, 1896, pages 203 to 440 with map of the United States showing the lines of equal magnetic declination for the year 1900. This memoir of 237 pages sets forth and discusses the data used in making the magnetic map which accompanies it. This map, whereon the curves of equal declination or isogonic lines for the year 1900 are shown, is about 18 by 28 inches in size and is printed in four colors black for projection lines names and all cultural features blue for streams green for the oceans and large lakes and brown for the hill and mountain features these relief features are shown by contour lines the contour interval from two thousand feet upward is one thousand feet below the two thousand foot contour the interval is variable over this base map the magnetic curves are printed in red the magnetic declination popularly called variation of the compass is subject to several known periodic changes of these the most important is the secular change a change with a period running through centuries hence its name as this secular change is progressive from year to year for long periods and as it amounts in the united states to from two feet to five feet per year it is for the surveyor and mariner the most important of the periodic changes indeed it is the only one of much practical importance at present it is to this practically important quantity that mr gannett has wisely devoted the greater part of the labor expended on this memoir the weakness of similar maps hitherto produced has been recognized by both their makers and users to be largely due to defective knowledge of the secular change of the two hundred thirty seven pages comprised in the memoir eighty two are devoted to data for secular change a table of results by counties occupies one hundred thirty five pages while the remaining twenty pages are given to introductory matter discussion 
statement of sources of data etc the sources of the data are the coast survey lake survey the wheeler hayden and powell surveys new york state survey new jersey geological survey boundary surveys united states corps of engineers army exploring expedition national academy of sciences and others but it is chiefly from the records of the united states general land office and from county surveyors that a vast quantity of hitherto unused material has been derived indeed so abundant are data in the general land office that it was only needful to select for the older land office states such as were desired the mass is much greater than is needed to produce a map sufficient for all practical needs as to this mr gannett says i have not attempted to make a complete collection of this material the amount is too vast to make it worth while i have however collected all the observations which appear upon the plats of exteriors and standard lines the land office requires that in the survey of all standard and exterior lines the declination be observed supplementing them wherever needed by observations made in connection with the subdivision of townships altogether i have abstracted from the plats of the general land office nearly twenty thousand observations and these form perhaps nine-tenths of the material herewith presented as the work of subdivision and accompanying magnetic observations began a century ago it is obvious that these land office records constitute a veritable storehouse of information on secular change a storehouse of which mr gannett is the first to make general use in addition to these data a circular was sent to all the county surveyors in the united states and from the returns much valuable information was obtained as the accuracy of the material from the land office and county surveyors is not of the highest the adopted mode of reduction was not the most accurate the graphic methods used were rapid and sufficiently accurate for the purpose which was to present in the form of a map and the form of a table the best knowledge available as to the magnetic declination in the year nineteen hundred the work was planned and executed as a practical matter and chiefly for the use of surveyors the only wonder is that the great stock of data in the general land office has not been hitherto made use of now that it has been perhaps some of the colleges and universities in the land office states may be stimulated to undertake a similar work for their own states going over all the data and supplementing them by observations where such are found to be desirable m b carpenter's geographical reader asia by frank g carpenter pages three hundred four with maps and illustrations new york american book company eighteen ninety seven this little book treats of the various countries of asia mainly with relation to the occupations social customs amusements etc of their inhabitants being derived in the main from personal observation and experience its descriptions are vivid and characteristic with plenty of local color h g studies in indiana geography edited by charles redway dreyer m a m d professor of geography in the indiana state normal school first series pages one hundred thirteen quarto terre haute indiana the inland publishing company eighteen ninety seven fifty cents this is a geographic reader treating of local geography shaped on the lines of modern science the dedication to professor william m davis is an index to the character of the book the opening chapter entitled the new geography is a most excellent statement of what geography should be the general physical geography of the state is given in broad outlines clearly and simply the topography of the state being largely the result of glacial deposition this subject receives considerable attention under the chapter headings the glacial deposits of indiana and the morainal lakes of indiana the natural resources of the state coal gas petroleum 
soils building stone clays etc receive a chapter an interesting subject only too briefly treated is the changes which have taken place in the surface of the state during the period of white occupation as a specimen of what might be done for all our great cities the book contains a study of the city of terre haute this consists of a number of questions intended to draw out from schoolboys a full account of the origin history location mode of government municipal improvements and social condition of the city it is exhaustive extremely suggestive and altogether admirable the book closes with a history of the great lakes which seems rather out of place in this connection the maps in the book are by no means in keeping with the quality of the text being crudely drawn and poorly executed the work as a whole is a most valuable addition to the teaching of geography and its influence will be felt not only in the state of indiana but elsewhere h g end of section six end of the national geographic magazine volume eight july august eighteen ninety seven